Okay, hello everyone. Um, so in this class, we're going to discuss a new topic about aerosol instrumentation, which is about the offline particle analysis. So first, let's do a quick recap. So last class, we mainly introduced the aerosol hygroscopicity. We uh, talked about that um, the vapor pressure of water surrounding a particle is, is um, determined by the Kelvin effect and the Rho effect, right? The aerosol hygroscopicity actually will influence the Rho effect and further influence, let's say, how the aerosols will grow into the cloud droplets. We also mentioned that in terms of measuring the aerosol hygroscopicity, we could use the tandem differential mobility analyzer, the TDMA, and the CCN counter. So we introduced the mechanisms of the instrument and how do we um, obtain uh, the, uh, let's say, the hygroscopicity of the aerosols. So I would say these measurements are still online based, right? So you can get the aerosol hygroscopicity in, even in real time if you could process the data in real time. Right. But this class, we're going to talk about the particle offline analysis, which will involve the sampling of the aerosols during the measurement and then uh, basically analyze the data or analyze the aerosols using offline imaging techniques, uh, which cannot happen at the same time with the aerosol sampling. Um, but although there is this time lag here, but actually the offline analysis can provide you much more information regarding the chemical composition, the structure, and also the, let's say, the uh, the different physiochemical pro pro uh, uh, properties of these aerosols. So in the following sections, I'm just going to use the slides uh, that is coming from Dr. Alexander Laskin, now at Purdue University. So uh, basically, uh, Dr. Laskin is a well-known scholar in the uh, atmospheric science, and his research expertise is actually regarding the offline analysis of these aerosols. So he has been working at the Environmental Molecular Science Laboratory, which is at the PNL, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And there he could uh, use a, a set of advanced aerosol imaging or offline sample imaging techniques to look into the physiochemical properties of these aerosols. And here I will just introduce what he summarizes regarding the different techniques or their specialties in aerosol analysis, and also some of the work from his group. Okay, so we're going to talk about the offline analysis of the particle samples. I would say that this involved two step process, right? The first step is how we collect the particles. As we know, we could use the impactors to collect the particles. We could use the filters to collect the particles, right? So after we collect the particle samples, we could expose them under different types of chemical characterization or physical characterizations. Here, um, uh, the slide is showing different sets of the uh, aerosol analysis methods, right? So you could use SEM, TEM, EDX, or use the X-ray um, let's say the imaging techniques, right? Microscopy techniques. So we're going to cover some of these uh, abbreviations later on in this class. So first we need to discuss the particle sampling. Um, so as we mentioned before, for the impactors or for the uh, filters, if you just use one step, one stage of the impactor, it can only provide you the ensemble of particles that does not provide any size information. Actually, people use this cascade impactor quite a lot for offline particle analysis. And we said that the cascade impactor can provide you the particle samples with sizes in different size bins, right? So here, uh, one specific type of uh, cascade impactor or the mood, uh, or, or one specific type of the cascade impactor is a moody impactor, which contains multiple stages. They can go down to around 10 nanometer and can cover the sizes up to two or three micrometers. So this is also a TSI instrument. And after the particles are collected onto the different stages of the Moody impactor, we could subject the aerosol samples for different types of the offline analysis. Of course, other types of particle collectors can be built, right? There can be home built systems or commercialized systems. For example, uh, they can use the mechanism or particle collection mechanisms of impaction, electrostatic collection, or even thermophoretic precipitation, where people uh, or basically for the thermophoretic 
uh, method. People use that in the combustion aerosol sampling quite a lot, right? Because the more threaded force are going to force the particles to a colder surface. And if you stick a cold metal sampler into a flame, then those flame generated particles will get deposited onto the sampler. So first, let's talk about the electron microscopy, right? So um, generally, the electron microscopy will involve the SEM, the commonly uh, known techniques like the SEM, which is scanning electron microscope uh, microscopy, and also the uh, TEM, transmission electron microscopy. Right? You can also use the X-ray that's generated from these electron interacting with the uh, particle samples and use the uh, X-ray, let's say X-ray dispersion uh, uh, analysis, right? Electron uh, dispersed X-ray or EDX to analyze the chemical compositions. So uh, if the electron beam is interacting with the particles. It's similar to the light in fact, interacting with the particles. You could have different types of scattering or different types of movement of the electrons. You could have the, uh, let's say, back scatter electrons. You could have the secondary electrons that's coming from the, let's say, the particle surface. You could have the uh, transmitted electrons, right? If the particle size is small, then the electrons can go through. And then basically they can interact with the internal structure of the particles. You could also have the transmitted electrons that are scattered forward, which is not directly, let's say, unscattered direction. You could generate the emitted X-ray, which basically involves the electrons hopping onto different energy levels that emit these secondary radiations. And you could have also have the uh, emitted auger electrons, which can be used for some other uh, types of the surface analysis. So regarding the scanning electron imaging uh, techniques, it's just like seeing an object using an, uh, a microscope, right? So if you consider the mechanism of the microscope, basically you will illuminate the particle surface. Like if you're trying to see some microbial samples under, let's say, the, the glass slide, you will illuminate the glass slide. Right, so all the microbial species are illuminated, right? And then further for these uh, uh, scattered lights here, you're going to use certain lenses to focus them, to further focus, and then eventually get into your, your eye. It is kind of similar for the scanning electron microscope, where uh, basically you will introduce the source of il illumination, which are the electrons, and then you will focus them and continuously to uh, focus right? Keep focusing until you get a very tiny or narrow beam, and then they should get shined onto the specimen. So once this specimen is illuminated, then it's going to emit these scattered electrons, right? And then you could detect them by the electron detectors. These are just your eyes, right? So basically for the SEM, it's using the secondary electrons, which are the electrons that are emitted from, directly from the surface of the particles. So because of that, the SEM is very sensitive to the surface uh, or the surface properties of the particles, right? So here is showing you a few pictures of different particle types and then how they are, um, their uh, SEM image looks like. So basically, it's just like taking pictures to the object, onto the object, right? It, you're directly getting the scattered uh, electrons from the surface. You could also get the backscattered uh, electrons which are not electrons scattered anywhere, but directly going back, right? So for the backscattered electrons, they're really dependent on the material density. So for example, if you're taking the same in image of some particle samples that are organics or soot particles, you can see that the uh, scattered uh, electrons, which are generated the SEM imaging, will give you the shapes, right? Because they're sensitive to the surface, but the backscattered um, electrons are going to give you like these higher contrasts. And then they actually represent materials with different density. For example, they're very sensitive to the imaging of the particles with high atomic number, right? So you can see the pot uh, uh, potassium from these particles, which in indicate that these are biomass burning particles because biomass contain these potassium elements, 
right? But on the other hand, they're quite insens uh, insensitive to the low atomic number elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. That's why you will see, let's say for the organics, you can't really see the particles very clearly. So we talk about these uh, scattered electrons, right? So there can be backscattered or just secondary uh, electrons. So there can also be electrons that are going through the sample. This only happens when the sample particles are really the small, right? So the particles that, or for the electrons that can go through the particles, we call them transmitted electrons. And this is why uh, we call this technique as the TEM or the transmission electron microscope. And as we know, the TEM only works for particles with smaller sizes, right? Because if the particle size is large, you cannot really get these transmitted electrons. So since these electrons will go through the particles, they're going to also interact with the atoms or those crystal, uh, crystal structures within the particles, right? So you can get finer details of the particle, let's say the crystallinity, and also, uh, let's say the internal structures of the particles. For example, here you can see uh, there are several pictures of some aerosols collected, right? You can see the internal structures. So now we're not only scattering electrons at the surface. And it's also sensitive to um, the, um, let's say the particles or materials with different density. And as we said, particles need to be sufficiently small or transparent for the electron beam. So that's why for the, uh, let's say when we're trying to um, uh, synthesize some nanoparticles, either from the gas phase or the, uh, the liquid phase, right? Or using these wet chemistry methods, Whenever people form relatively smaller nanoparticles, they will use the, uh, the TEM. And one advantage of the TEM is that if you're forming particles with very well-controlled conditions, you're going to form crystals. And then you could even see the crystal pattern in the, uh, or the grids in, the, in these particles. And then just counting the layers of crystals or counting the faces arranged in the particles, you could tell what type of, uh, uh, let's say, chemical composition it is, right? Because now it's purely decided by the crystallinity of the species, okay? So, um, well, this is, again, some images about that are obtained from the TEM, right? So, for example, here for soot particles, you can really see these layered hydrocarbons that are embedded within these soot particles. And as you can see, the size or the scale bar here just represents 10 nanometers, right? Which can be, give you very fine detailed internal structures of the particles. So basically the TEM can give you particle internal structures which with, with higher level of detail and sub nanometer resolution. So we could also use the mixed back scattered electron and uh, transmission electron imaging, right? So as we said, the back scattered electrons uh, are they're sensitive to like, they're being used for the larger particles, right? Or also the secondary electron uh, or the secondary uh, electrons, they're being used for the larger particles. Well, the, uh, the four scattered or transmitted electrons, they can um, censor the internal structure of the particles. <laughs> Excuse me. So by using this mixed uh, BSC TE imaging, you can obtain the simultaneous imaging of the smaller particles and the large particles. Like here, if you're just using the uh, SEM method, right? You're just looking at the larger particles, but now if you have the mixed method, then you can also see these finer particles. So, um, and uh, this can obtain a high imaging contrast and the signal stability. They're suitable for some uh, advanced uh, particle analysis, advanced particle analysis method. So the CCSEM or actually the computer controlled SEM, we're going to talk about that later on. So apart from these scattered electrons, we could also use the X-ray that's emitted from the interaction between the electrons and the particles. So as we know, the electrons will occupy different uh, energy levels. When the electrons interact with the atom or the material in the particles, then the elect some electrons will hop onto different energy levels. Basically, they will go down the energy level, in the energy level. And then 
if they go down, they're going to release the energy, re the radiation energy that are emitted in the X-ray type of wavelengths. And you can use the X-ray wavelengths to tell which particle or which element it is, right? So uh, basically this can characterize the particle uh, elemental composition. It can detect different particle types. And then it can do quantitative analysis of elemental con uh, concentrations for atomic number that are larger than sodium. Because normally for these heavier elements, there will be multiple energy levels getting involved, right? You can somewhat get, let's say the fingerprint of the, energy levels that are involved or the X-ray that are involved in this process. And it's getting, it can get semi-quantitative analysis of low uh, or low atomic number elements. So basically here, it's showing you some of these X-ray analysis. Uh, and uh, for the SEM or TEM, um, if you have operated them before, they also have the mode of called the energy dispersed X-rays or the EDX. So basically the EDX is using the X-ray that are emitted from the interaction between the electrons and the particles. And from the EDX, you can tell which type of element it is, right? And this is especially useful for detecting different types of metals. For example, the calcium, the magnesium, the silicon, nitrogen, sulfur, right? These different types of elements. <laughs> and they can also achieve relatively large penetration depths, which are getting into the, uh, or, or if you have particles that have smaller sizes, right, below uh, one micro, the submicron particles, you could directly get the chemical composition of these particles. So some more results regarding using the SEM for the elemental analysis of the particles, right? So um, I introduced this earlier, but people could use, or people design these computer controlled SEM or EDEX or the CCSEM. So as you see, well, when we operate the SEM or TEM, we have to focus the instrument onto the particles we're interested in. But in general, when we um, collect the ambient aerosols, there are just so many particles inside, right? We don't want to do that manually. So the CCSEM SEM basically is an algorithm that can detect particles in a large quantity. So you don't need to manually change the the location of the beam and then to do the analysis separately. So this is going to be an automated elemental analysis of statistically significant number of individual particles. So by using the EDX, you could tell the chemical composition of the particles. And further, for different types of particles, they're going to have their um, characteristic, characteristic chemical composition. So which are like the uh, the specific, let's say, mass spectrum that we talk about when we we're discussing the PF, uh, PMF analysis, right? So we're trying to uh, <clears throat> attribute the particles into different sources. So by combining some further, uh, more algorithms regarding the, the, let's say, machine learning or k-means or other statistical methods, you could use these analysis to uh, basically uh, attribute the particles into different types of aerosols. For example, um, you already have the MODI uh, impactor to collect particles of different sizes, right? Or from the CCSEM, it can directly tell you what the size of the particle is. And then you could find out for each size of the particles, what is the major chemical compositions, right? Are they aged sea salt or are they combination sodium rich aerosols or are they combination potassium rich aerosols and so on? So in this way, you could do a source apportion of the particle types based on the characteristic elemental composition. So um, here are some more examples, right? So the CCSM is very useful when you're trying to analyze a large amount of uh, aerosols that you collect from different samples. So right now, actually, uh, you could, anyone could apply for access at PNL to use their CCSM system, right? So every year the PNL will have open calls for using the these advanced imaging instruments, right? So if you're interested, you could always just reach out to the agency and see how you could, or your project will fit the overall goal of the PNL. So we've talked about uh, the, uh, let's say the electrons that are being scattered, electrons 
that can transmit and also the X-ray that are uh, emitted from this interaction here. So we could also track, well, for these transmitted electrons, uh, since they're colliding with the atoms inside, right? So they will also lose some energy. So they lose the, the loss of the energy is actually rela related to the chemical composition or the functional groups in these aerosols. So we could find out what are the loss of the energy for these electrons when they transmit through the, uh, the particle samples and then actually use their loss spectrum as their fingerprint for different types of chemical bondings. For example, here, this is again showing the TM image, but you can analyze the, uh, the, the electron loss, right? And this method is called the electron energy loss spectrometry. So from the electron loss, you could tell what type of bondings, for example, if that's a, a pi bond in the particles that are interacting or reducing the energy of the electrons. So until now, we've talked about the imaging techniques that are using the, the electrons as the beam source, right? Or as the beam or illum illumination source. We could also change the illumination source to the X-ray, right? So one reason to change it to X-ray is that, well, for the SEM or, or TEM, when we're introducing electrons, the electrons, although they're really light, but they're, they still have a mass, right? So they could lead to some damages to the particles. And if you just use that or change the source into the radiation, since these are just photons, they don't have any mass, right? They won't, um, basically they will not, they will generate a smaller damage to the particles where you can get a more realistic or representative analysis of the particles. So there's method called the scanning transmission X-ray microscopy or the near edge X-ray absorption fine structure. I have to say that these instruments are relatively um, uh, limited, right? So right now there are relatively few instruments that are using X-ray as the, the uh, source for the, let's say for conducting the microscopy of the aerosol samples, but they're really powerful. Okay, so you could uh, basically move the samples, right? Move the specimen and get a 2D structure or 2D image of the, uh, of the let's say the particle samples. So from these X-ray analysis, what it's really uh, good at is to obtain the chemical bonding information from these uh, collected samples. Right, so basically from the, uh, let's say this, the scattered or transmitted photon energy, you could get what type of chemical bondings are there in these, um, in these collected sampled aerosols, okay? And from this bonding information, you could further obtain the, uh, let's say the elemental information, for example, the organic carbon, elemental carbon, or potassium from these uh, aerosols can tell you what is a sea salt or a secondary organic aerosols, okay? So uh, for the XDSM or NEXAFS methods, right? So you could also analyze the iron containing dust particles. I believe there are also analysis of the sulfur in the marine particles, uh, trying to look at how the dimethyl sulfide is playing a role in generating aerosols over the open ocean. So apart from these conventional SEM or TEM or the microscopy using the X-ray analysis, there's uh, now wider application of the environmental SEM, TEM. So we mentioned their environmental SEM or TEM, they actually mean that they can operate the sample under a condition that are related to the ambient condition. So as we know, for the conventional SEM or TEM, you have to generate a vacuum condition for the uh, collected samples, right? So the instrument needs to be operated at the vacuum. So under this situation, you will lose the volatile organic compounds in these aerosol samples, right? And at the same time, since it's un operated under the vacuum condition, you don't have any water vapor. So water is also evaporated. And as we know from our last class, if you lose water, then you go through the effervescence process. There may be even structural changes of these aerosols after you put them into the vacuum condition under the SEM-TEM. So for these environmental SEM or environmental TEM, 
basically they are the specimen or the aerosol samples can be housed in an environment that uh, is close to the ambient condition. So I have to notice that they are not completely ambient, let's say one atmosphere or whatever the chemical composition it is. Because if you have too much of the interference from the ambient air, then as we know, the electrons will also get scattered by those components, right? And also the, uh, the same for the X-ray. So, uh, but they are being controlled that, for example, we can control the relative humidity in these chambers. So we can try to look at how the uh, hygroscopic growth of the particles might influence the structure of the particles. For example, you can obtain this or observe this in situ particle deliquescence and hygroscopic growth under this uh, environmental SEM. This is using the uh, calcium nitrate, right? So you can see under the RH of 10%, they already ob uh, obtain water and grow into these uh, droplets. The same thing for here, right? So when the RH increases, you get these larger droplets here. And then uh, this is the uh, the application of the elect uh, the environmental TEM. Um, this is trying to look at different salt particles, and then you can see under the higher RH, they start to acquire water and then grow into these droplets. So this is a more direct way to predict whether the particles will grow into cloud droplets under higher supersaturation, right? So you could directly obtain the, let's say, the hygroscopicity of the aerosols from these imaging techniques, right? So when you have mixed particles with mixed chemical composition, they may also grow under different uh, RH and then lead to different optical properties of the aerosols, further influence the, let's say, the uh, cloud albedo, right? And then the uh, generate some climate effects. So here are some more uh, introductions about the structures of these scanning SEM, or basically these are environmental uh, stixum or NEXAFS, right? So they're using the uh, environmental conditions for the X-ray um, imaging of the particles, right? So there are some designs and then we could use these systems to look at the, uh, let's say the chemically resolved imaging of the particles, with uh, different hygroscopic transmissions, uh, transformations. Okay, so we could also look into the different bondings. For example, this um, section here is showing that under high RH, RH some of the organic acids actually the carboxyl group, carboxyl group, turn into or the double bond between the carbon and oxygen turn into a hydroxyl group. Right. So basically it means that under high RH, these AC group changing some change to some other chemical groups. And what we obtain from the dry samples, let's say the dry particles, may not represent what's really happening under the cloud conditions. Okay. So uh, that's it for this class. So again, this is a really quickly uh, quick overview of the particle offline analysis method. So if you're interested, you can feel free to spend more time reading these um, these uh, slides or just check the papers that are uh, referred in these slides. Right? So um, if you're interested in using these instruments, as I said, you could check out the check out the EMSL uh, uh, website or you could also con or even contact the Dr. Laskin to see if they're could be uh, potential opportunities for collaborations, okay? Uh, thank you all for your attention and feel free to let me know if you have any questions.